This is Lisa Clapier in Park City, and this wraps up our time occupying Sundance Film Festival 2012, where we have been featuring Occupy Wall Street films from filmmakers emerging out of the movement. These films are representing evolutionary best practices, inspirations, the people, and the stories, positive effects from what the movement has inspired during the past four months, effectively educating and making positive change in the world. And it's been very encouraging because some of our screenings have been standing room only. This has been an incredible opportunity to educate and invite people into a greater dialogue about what's been happening from within the Occupy Wall Street movement. Sharing the dynamic stories from within the movement and showcasing the art and the beauty that these filmmakers have created, depicting a revolution of truth and love, honor, integrity, and hope for a better future for our children, our communities, economic equality, and our planet. During our time here, we were number one on Google News. We were featured in Fox News, and we were the cover of the local Salt Lake City Tribune and other feature articles from throughout the United States. We even garnered a response from Robert Redford himself, quote, Sundance reflects the 99%, and raising wonderful dialogue and questions about corporate sponsorship for the film festival. Even for this festival, which was originally created by activist Redford himself, to showcase emerging artists' work who were not yet making it into the corporate film market. So it's been an honor to witness these featured news stories covering these incredible filmmakers who have come out of the Occupy Wall Street movement at Sundance Film Festival 2012. So signing off for this year and also giving you my pick from all of the films featured during the Occupy Sundance Film Festival 2012, here is Occupy Wall Street, The Revolution is Love. This movement isn't about the 99% defeating or toppling the 1%. You know the next chapter of that story, which is that the 99% create a new 1%. That's not what it's about. What we want to create is the more beautiful world our hearts tell us is possible, a sacred world, a world that works for everybody, a world that is healing, a world of peace. You can't just say, we demand a world of peace. Demands have to be specific. Anything that people can articulate can only be articulated within the language of the current political discourse. And that entire political discourse is already, is already too small. And that's why making explicit demands kind of reduces the movement and takes the heart out of it. And so it's a real paradox. And so I think that the, the movement actually understands that. The system isn't working for the 1% either. You know, if you were a CEO, you would be making the same choice as they do. The institutions have their own logic. Life is pretty bleak at the top, too. And all of the baubles of the rich, they're kind of this um, phony compensation for the loss of what's really important. The loss of community, the loss of connection, the loss of intimacy, the loss of meaning. Everybody wants to live a life of meaning. And today, we live in a money economy where we don't really depend on the gifts of anybody, but we buy everything. Therefore, we don't really need anybody because whoever grew my food or made my clothes or built my house, well, if they died or if I alienate them, if they don't like me, that's okay. I can just pay somebody else to do it. And it's really hard to create community if the underlying knowledge is we don't need each other. So people kind of get together and they act nice or maybe they consume together. But joint consumption doesn't create intimacy. Only joint creativity and gifts create intimacy and connection. You have such gifts that are important. Just like every species has an important gift to give to an ecosystem and the extinction of any species hurts everybody. The same is true of each person that you have a necessary and important gift to give. And that for a long time, our minds have told us that maybe we're imagining things, that it's crazy to live according to what you want to give. 
But I think now, as more and more people wake up to the truth that we're here to give and wake up to that desire and wake up to the fact that the other way isn't working anyway, the more reinforcement we have from people around us that this isn't crazy, this makes sense, this is how to live. And as we get that reinforcement, then our minds and our logic no longer have to fight against the logic of the heart, which wants us to be of service. This shift of consciousness that inspires such things is universal in everybody, 99% and 1%, and it's awakening in different people in different ways. I think love is the felt experience of connection to another being. An economist says that essentially more for you is less for me, but the lover knows that more for you is more for me too. If you love somebody, then their happiness is your happiness. Their pain is your pain. Your sense of self expands to include other beings. That's love. Love is the expansion of the self to include the other. And that's a different kind of revolution. There's no one to fight. There's no evil to fight. There's no other in this revolution. Everybody has a unique calling. And it's really time to listen to that. That's what the future is going to be. It's time to get ready for it and to help contribute to it and make it happen.